chapter 13 and verse 32 reads, But of that day and hour no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Now this verse makes a distinction between Jesus and God, and it gives biblical evidence that Jesus and God are not one and the same. My name is Paul, and in this bite-sized video as part of the Gospel Online series, let's look at the context of this verse to understand firstly what Jesus was talking about, where's this verse come from, before exploring what this then means for us. Don't forget to subscribe and click on the bell icon to receive notifications if you want to keep up with the series as we release new videos every week. So the context then, we were in Mark chapter 13 there in verse 32. To understand the context of how Jesus has arrived at this point, um, let's just for argument's sake consider only what has been told to us through the account of Mark and the gospel of Mark. So in the first 12 chapters of Mark, what has Jesus had to say? Well, if we go back, for example, to Mark chapter 4, we see that in verse 30, he's talking about a kingdom, the kingdom of God. In this case, he's likening it to a mustard seed and giving a parable that explains what the kingdom of God will be like. Um he also teaches about his death and his resurrection. In fact, he says um, in three separate occasions, he talks about the fact that he will be killed and he will rise again on the third day in chapters 8 and 9 and 10. Jesus also teaches about how to live a godly lifestyle. In fact, he spends a lot of time in these early chapters of Mark explaining what our response to his message should look like, how we should live our lives in response to, to what he has taught us. Um, if you want to see that, then, you know, look at chapter 7, chapter 9, chapter 10, chapter 11, chapter 12. Throughout the Gospel of Mark, there's a lot of good advice on how to live our lives as we try to serve God and emulate Jesus. Um, Jesus also tells us in chapter 8, about a coming time of judgment. In verse 38 of Mark chapter 8, it says, whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. So there is a, a coming time when Jesus will return and he will either be pleased or displeased with what we have said and thought and done um, in our lives before his return. And Jesus also talks about uh, a time of resurrection in Mark chapter 12. He's challenged in verse 18 by the Sadducees who say there is no resurrection. Um, they ask him to explain something about resurrection and he does. Um, so he endorses the idea of resurrection. Verse 25, for when they rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage. And that brings us to chapter 13. So in chapter 13 and verse 3, <clears throat> we see that most of chapter 13 is actually a conversation in private between Jesus and his disciples, Peter, James, John and Andrew. Verse 3 says, as Jesus sat on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, John and Andrew asked him privately. The question, verse 4, tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign when all these things will be fulfilled? So this shows us that these disciples who would have been present for near enough all of Jesus' teaching, everything that's recorded in Mark and more, um, they had deduced from what Jesus had told them that this kingdom and this time of judgment would be linked to Jesus coming to them. They just witnessed um, a couple of chapters earlier in chapter 11, what is now referred to as the, the triumphal entry, um, where crowds of people laid down their coats and laid down palm branches on the road um, as Jesus passed by sitting on a, um, the, the foal of a donkey, as if Jesus was royalty. They were giving him all of this respect and saying, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Presumably, the participants in this event and the onlookers to this event would have anticipated some form of uprising against the, the Roman regime that was in place at the time, with Jesus as its figurehead, as its, as its royalty, if you like. 
Perhaps that then would be the beginning of the judgment that would precede God's kingdom. But in chapter 13, we find that the uprising hadn't happened since chapter 11. There had been no judgment day and there was no sign of God's kingdom. And as a result, the disciples had a lot of questions as to when exactly this promised kingdom would happen, because perhaps they got their hopes up. And Jesus' response? Well, in chapter 13, he tells them of a coming time of troubles, uh, of wars, of rumours of wars, of earthquakes, of famines. And he says in verse 8 of chapter 13 that these things would be the beginning of the birth pangs. So in the same way that, that labour pains start infrequently but gradually become more frequent and more intense, world events involving the Jews were to follow the same pattern. We note that um, this time that Jesus is talking about in answer to this question um, would come once the gospel had been preached to all nations, it says in verse 10. And whilst the biblical record tells us of the remarkable spread of the gospel message in the first century, um, just look at the book of Acts if you want to see that, this work of spreading the gospel to all nations is still ongoing today, 2,000 years later. We also see in Jesus' response to his disciples, um, let's look at verse 19, where he says, For in those days there will be tribulation such as has not been since the beginning of the creation which God created until this time, nor ever shall be. Now this is actually quite a sobering verse when you consider the biblical accounts of the worldwide flood in Genesis chapters 7 and 8, which wiped out all humans except Noah and his family, eight people in total. <clears throat> Verse 26 and 27 of Mark chapter 13, they describe um, the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. And he will send his angels and gather together his elect from the four winds, from the farthest part of the earth to the farthest part of heaven. It talks about um, Jesus returning, gathering his elect, which we understand to be those who have devoted their lives to following his teaching in service to God. There's a lot of things here that, um, as far as I'm aware, have not happened yet. If they had happened in the last 2000 years since Jesus spoke these words, where is the kingdom that God promised would follow the return of his son? If Jesus has returned, where is the kingdom? <clears throat> so once Jesus has described to his disciples what the lead up to his return will be. Remember, that's what they've asked. They've asked, what will the sign be? We find ourselves back in verse 32, where we started, where he warns them off trying to determine exactly when he would return by stating that even he doesn't know. He doesn't know when it will be. Only God knows when Jesus will return. <clears throat> Why? Well, <laughs> I don't know what you're like with deadlines, <laughs> but when I've got a deadline, I'll often put off doing the work until the very last minute because I know I can. And I'll put it, pull it out of the bag um, and I'll get it done the night before, if you like. If Jesus had been able to give us a specific date or even a specific time period for his return to the earth, what would there be to motivate us to follow the advice he'd spent so much of his time um, prior to, to this point in the Gospel of Mark, giving about how to live a godly lifestyle. Why would we listen to any of that if we know he's not going to return until three weeks on Thursday? Surely you leave it till the Wednesday night to, to clean up your act. And in the meantime, just live however you want. If you think about it, our chance to respond to the Gospel message ends when we die or when Jesus returns, whichever one comes first. So in the same way that we don't know when we're going to die, we also don't know when Jesus will return. And as such, if we want to respond and take positive action in our lives, we have to do it today and every day from now on. And this is the challenge and the responsibility that comes to us from hearing the gospel message. If you want to believe in the doctrine of the Trinity, where God and Jesus are parts of the same entity, you can tie yourself in knots trying to explain away why Jesus didn't know something that God did. 
some might take the approach that perhaps Jesus forgot some things when he was busy being God in human form. But I can't find any scriptural evidence for Jesus' pre-existence in any form other than in God's plans prior to being born to Mary. God not knowing everything at any point. And Jesus relearning things that he'd forgotten. I can't find these things in the scriptures. Let me know in the comments if you can. <clears throat> so I find it much more compelling to read and understand this passage as it's presented to us. That Jesus did not know the time of his return because he is not God. Remember the context and message of this passage of scripture. <clears throat> How will you choose to respond today? If you've any questions or comments on the content that I've covered today, please do uh, leave a comment below. And thank you for listening. Mm -hmm.